Inductive logic programming is really um, the intersection of various different fields, and this is the way that it was formulated. Um, so it's the intersection of machine learning, computational logic, and, and programming. Um, but its roots go back uh, now, in 2018, 50 years, um, to the start of the PhD, uh, very important PhD of Gordon Plotkin, um, who's well known in program semantics and, and other uh, areas of computational logic as well. Uh, but his PhD was on uh, doing induction within first order logic and he was inspired by some of the resolution theorem working, theorem proving work that was going on that came out of Robinson's uh, uh, work. So, uh, so I'm going to take you, I'm not going to take you through 50 years of research. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make, give you a kind of uh, uh, rapid progress in the first part of my uh, tutorial through some of the key ideas, possibly of the first 20 or, th or th even 30 years of that, and then fast forward for the remainder of the talk into things that are current, okay? So this field, just to give you an idea, has been having international conferences one every year uh, since 1991. That still goes on the next one. If anybody was interested, it is in, is in Italy um, coming up this summer. Um, uh, and uh, so, I, as I say, I'm not going to cover all of that. The way that uh, this is arranged is in two 90-minute blocks, and I've bro broken each of those into three parts, uh, each of which should uh, take uh, half an hour. So in the first one, uh, this, this part of the lecture, or this 1.1 uh, part, um, I'll be giving you an introduction to uh, to, what, to the, the ideas behind inductive logic programming, key ideas to do with generalization, and some techniques that uh, have been introduced, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, notions, uh, mathematical notions to do that, that relate entailment to the notion of generalization. Um, I'm then going to progress through into, as I said, more recent stuff, basically in the last five years, uh, in which there's a new framework that uh, has started to be explored uh, in a lot of detail. And I'll motivate why that uh, has become important, uh, what it deals with that the previous uh, inductive logic programming framework didn't do. And this framework is uh, called meta-interpretive learning. I'll show you various different aspects of that, which cover both uh, the logical side of things, but also end up with um, the probabilistic, uh, the inter the, uh, probabilistic constructs, the way that Bayesian inference is worked in, or can, has been worked in to uh, meta-interpretive learning. And uh, although, uh, as we said, this is logic day, uh, in fact, uh, Bayesian inference has, has played an important part, uh, at least since the 1990s, in the formulation of the machine learning side of uh, inductive logic programming. So this is uh, a rather recent part of that. So I'm trying to give you as much detail of what's new and interesting in the hope that uh, you're drawn to this area if you're in, uh, intending to uh, look at it from a research perspective. Okay, so the lecture material, in case you want to get hold of it, is on the web. Uh, and the web address uh, I've given here so anybody wants to look this up, it's www.docicacuk, tilde shm, which are my initials, flock ilp, and then if you look in that directory, you'll find lecture 1.1, etc. Uh, there's also, for each one of those lectures, there are associated uh, papers. Uh, so uh, just to give you an idea for this part, 1.1, the papers uh, 01 and 02 from that site are there. Uh, so I'll be, uh, if you want to refer back to the material and understand it in more detail, because I'm just going to, in half an hour, I can't give you more than a kind of glimpse idea of what, what's going on. These are inverse entailment and Progol, and uh, it's the extension paper to theory completion um, 
So take a look at those uh, if you want to study further uh, the material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with one of the key questions uh, that, uh, that uh, as I mentioned, Gordon Plotkin's work addressed, which is at the intersection area of uh, understanding logic and, uh, and machine learning, because the notion of generalization uh, is, is, uh, is at the heart of the idea of induction. So for those of you unaware of, of philosophical induction, uh, this is an idea from Aristotle where you can take specific facts, uh, you take a set of individual statements, and then you, uh, you generalize those statements. You form a generalization of them. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples here. So suppose uh, we looked at statement A and statement B. Um, I could ask you now, which do you think of A and B is more general? Daffy Duck can fly or all ducks can fly? So put up your hand if you think it's A. Oh, half a hand there. Anybody for B? Everybody agrees Daffy Duck can fly. Or all ducks can fly is, is more general than Daffy Duck can fly. Okay, now let's look at statements C and D. Um, which is more general? Marek lives in London or Marek lives in England? So uh, anybody who thinks that C is more general? One there, two, three, interesting, four. And D, Marek lives in England, the rest of you. Okay, so, um, so I'm afraid the, 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 that every, although everybody was right with this first one, most people were wrong with the second one. Actually, for obscure reasons I'm just about to show you, Marek lives in London is a more general statement that Marek lives in England, which is confusing to everybody when they look at this uh, problem to begin with. But in order to, to give you an idea of how that comes about, you have to, start, you have to actually study some of uh, Plotkin's formulation of the notion of generalization. And we're going to start off actually pre-Plotkin with John Reynolds' work on simple generalization. And uh, we start with a the notion of a logical substitution which is a set of uh, pairs of uh, variables versus terms, which tell you how to replace a set of variables in a formula F with corresponding terms T, <coughs> okay? Uh, we write F theta, where theta is the substitution, is formed by replacing all of those variables. And then uh, we can take the notion applied to atoms <laughs> And we can introduce an ordering, uh, which uh, uh, Reynolds refers to as subsumption, this A greater than or equal to B, uh, and say that that's true if and only if there exists a, a subsumption theta such that A theta is equal to B, okay? So this is, a, a kind of, this is an idea of generalization, if you like, over atoms. So an, an atom, the atom A is a more general one than B, just as our, uh, the, our uh, actually the other way around, all ducks can fly is more general than A. Uh, in, this, in the circumstances that we can apply a substitution and get a, uh, an atom B. Um, then uh, Plotkin generalized this to clauses, so disjunctions of, of atomic formulae, uh, universally quantified disjunctions of atomic formulae, and he says clause C subsumes clause D, similar to this, or generalizing over the, the notion of atomic uh, subsumption, if and only if <laughs> there exists a substitution theta, such that C theta is a subset of D, where we're taking clauses as being sets. The disjunctions represent the set of the literals uh, in that clause. Okay, so, uh, but, so these are both... Uh, ways of describing a form of generalization known as theta subsumption. So let's have a look at a particular example, the one that we looked at before. We have to take the statement Daffy Duck can fly, turn it into a logical formula. That might be something like can fly, the predicate can fly applied to the uh, 
uh, to the constant Daffy. Uh, all ducks can fly, so universally quantified can fly X. Um, I'm using a kind of prologue type style uh, uh, conventions of leaving out the universal quantification over X here, but just read that as for all X can fly X. And then uh, we can see that can fly X, theta subsumes can fly uh, Daffy because there exists a substitution theta is equal to X substitute for Daffy, right? So, uh, so we can take, in this case, this as support to the statement that all ducks can fly is more general, i.e. it theta subsumes the other statement. Right, so uh, that idea of theta subsumption is a, is a very much of uh, a syntactic uh, notion, if you like. Uh, but uh, it is in line, if you think about the, those relationships with uh, specific applications of the notion of, of entailment, i.e. Uh, uh, the, the relationship between, of subset relationship between the models of the formulae. So in this more general setting, we can say that C is more general than D if and only if C entails D. And in fact, if you look back at the uh, Plotkin uh, definition here, this is a special case of, um, of that uh, formula. So this is not true in the case that C and D are recursive uh, clauses, but otherwise uh, uh, it's, it's consistent. So uh, Plotkin then generalized this notion to relative entailment, where he brings in this notion that when you're learning, uh, you often have some background knowledge about uh, the formulae that you looked at, you're looking at, and he says that you can generalize this simple generalization notion to that of relative entailment with respect to some background formula B, if you say uh, that C is more general than D with respect to B, if and only if the conjunction of B and C entail D. Okay, so uh, B and C entails D uh, is your notion of general, general entailment. Okay, so where might this be useful? Uh, this idea of relative entailment. Well, let's look again at the second example, the harder one, and you can see where this kind of notion of background knowledge might be useful because when we write out these formula in logic, we write Marek lives in London, and it says lives Marek London and lives Marek England. There's something that probably most of us in the room know, which is that London and England are not simply symbols in some arbitrary signature, but they themselves have some relationship which we know about. It's our background knowledge which could be stated. And that uh, background knowledge might be stated in a formula like this, for instance, that uh, anybody who lives in London lives in England, okay? That living in London implies something about living in England, right? So we cannot simply treat these two uh, uh, statements in the way that we w did before because clearly neither subsumes the other, right? Because there's no substitution that takes you from lives Marrick England to lives Marrick London or vice versa. However, they are, they are related statements. There is some relationship between them but only if we take into account this background knowledge, right? And if we do so, we can see that one of them implies the other with respect to the background knowledge, okay? So looking at that, um, now ask yourself which one implies the other? And in fact, with respect to this background knowledge, if you know that Marek lives in London, you can entail that Marek lives in England, okay? So that means that there's a relative entailment between the first statement and the second statement, and that means that according to Plotkin relative generalization, the first statement is more general than the second. Now that's confusing, that confused everybody apart from a few in the audience, 
But if you think about it in the sense that which is more informative of the two statements, then it's clear that the first statement is more informative than the second. It tells you more, right? Um, it elim eliminates more models, and so therefore, uh, it's, it's a more general statement in that sense. Okay, um, so we've already seen that the three elements that uh, are used in, the, in all of the definitions of inductive logic programming, or at least in the standard definition. There are some non-standard general uh, uh, settings for ILP. But in this one, which comes initially from Plotkin, we always consider there as being at least three elements, okay? We can think of background knowledge, um, examples. So background knowledge might be uh, like the statement about uh, London and England. Examples are sets of unit clauses and hypotheses. And if you put these into a logic programming framework, or actually into a computational logic framework in general, you find that uh, you can you can set up a, a model of generalization which is based on Plotkin's uh, rel relative generalization such that if you're given some examples and you, you're provided with some background knowledge, things you already know, then uh, you learning consists of formulating a hypothesis and adding it to the background knowledge such that it explains the examples, okay? So this is, a, this is clearly a form of machine learning um, because it involves generalization and it involves hypotheses and the generalizations allow you to predict outside of the initial sample of examples that you were given. But it involves an element, this B element, which you won't find in any of the other forms of machine learning that are around that I know of, okay? So I'm, not, I'm saying that with a lot of knowledge of having looked at all of the different forms of machine learning, this is really not, this is one of the most important aspects that divides inductive logic programming as a form of machine learning from all others, okay? There are other aspects that divide it. So one of these is it's a general way of formulating the notion of programming and programming by examples, i.e., learning or synthesizing a program from examples, it allows and supports relationships in a way that you don't find in other forms of machine learning which are feature-based. Um, and uh, so, uh, and the, the allowing of background knowledge also has a rather interesting property when you think about what we mean by the notion of learning, okay? If I told you that uh, as, a, as a human being, every time you learn, you have to do so in the absence of all previous uh, learning that you'd ever done, you would find that very strange because learning allows you to learn more things uh, uh, over and above what you've learned already. If you look at standard forms of machine learning, they don't because they don't have a place for background knowledge. You can't easily formulate a notion of continuous learning where you build up background knowledge which allows you to learn better the next thing that you're learning. So even understanding, for instance, how to learn mathematics is a very weird thing if you think about it in most forms of machine learning. In inductive logic programming, it's completely natural because Background knowledge can be augmented, revised, and used to learn further things. So it's quite, a, it's quite a kind of natural notion of learning with respect to human learning. <coughs> right, search and refinement. Um, these are the kind of key idea, again, a key idea. Once you've got to the, the idea that, uh, that it's ful fulfilling the relationship between B, H, and E that is the, the goal of the learning, the obvious question is, how do you do the learning, therefore? And this is the algorithmic question. Algorithmically, how do we find H given B and E? And there are many different answers to this, okay? So uh, in general, you're carrying out a search of clauses. You might do this, for instance, from simple to complex. You start consider considering simple hypotheses, 
and you only consider more complex ones afterwards, <laughs> or you might go the other way around. You might start with general concepts and then make them more specific. Um, the idea of refining uh, a hypothesis, successive refinement of hypothesis, is uh, an, again, again one of the central uh, bricks of, of inductive logic programming, introduced by Udi Shapiro uh, at least 10 years after uh, Plotkin's work, um, it, completely in the context of logic programming in his PhD thesis under Dana Angloin uh, at Harvard. And uh, it was a fantastic piece of work. If you ever have a chance to read that, the book of this, it's really, really worth reading uh, because all of the notions are so clear um, and uh, he managed to prove some very, very general results. Just to give you an idea of what was quite, uh, of his central idea of refinement, so ref this is the same, well, this is an adaptation of the notion of refinement within, um, within uh, programming languages. So uh, Shapiro's refinement works by uh, considering formulae, uh, in this case, let's start with the simplest possible formula, false, and then alter that formula in a ver variety of different ways. So he has refinement rules, one of those rules allows you to add uh, a, claw, a, a clause with an additional atom in it. So it, going, you can go from false through here through to lives UV. Okay, you can consider lives UV as a hypothesis. If you then wanted to consider a more specific hypothesis, because this says everywhere, everybody lives everywhere, then you might say, okay, well, we'll say lives UV if lives WX. So this is adding another literal into the clause, but in this case, because it's a, uh, a, a definite clause, we have to add it into the body, but all of the variables are disjoint from the head. Another form of refinement shown on this second arc here, you say, okay, let's bind those two variables together, make U and V the same. And the third one, we might bind not the variables together, but bind them to a function symbol um, uh, in the language or a constant in the language. And Shapiro managed to show in his thesis that just with the th those three operations, you can construct every uh, definite clause uh, program uh, uh, using, a, using a, a systematic search of that kind. So, um, yeah, so there's a very beautiful and elegant theory uh, that Shapiro has. Uh, incorporated into his MIS system, which has also been used in, a, in countless other systems, including uh, Ross Quinlan's FOIL system. Um, the search in all of those systems, which is based on refinement, um, has a property which is that it's open-ended, okay? So it's never quite clear how far down in the, in the subsumption lattice, the lattice of subsuming formulae, you should apply uh, before stopping. Every time, you, every time you consider another point in the space, you need to test those clauses that you've formulated against all of the examples. And it's an infinitely descending chain, okay? So it's an infinite hypothesis space. There is no uh, end to it. And in fact, uh, some of Plotkin's results show precisely that, that you can always construct uh, subsuming uh, clauses as far down as you like. So this was a, a weakness, I, I think, in retrospect, of the Shapiro model. Um, there was a, an alternative approach uh, which, uh, was which I introduced back in, 19, in the uh, mid-1990s called inverting entailment, which was somewhat different. I mean, if you notice carefully, there's a relationship here possibly between the examples, which you, you're constructing these formulae out, out of, and the function symbols and predicate symbols that you've been told are in the signature, but there is no relationship, there's no bounding relationship to the background knowledge. And I told you background knowledge is really essentially uh, important within uh, Plotkin's definitions of, uh, of the framework. So here, uh, B and H entails E. When you look at this, or when, when I was looking at this, I suddenly started to realize that you could 
you could rearrange this formula, okay? So if I said B and not E entails not H, so just by switching E and H around the entailment sign and negating them, you could actually uh, get an equivalent formula. So this is true for every B, E, and H that the first one is true of. But it has a different property because the problem with B and H entails E is that we don't have any way of going backwards from E to H, right? So we know uh, that we can use uh, deductive inference to go forwards, but the question that we're looking at in induction is how do we go backwards? In inverse, inverse entailment, we solve this problem by simply switching those around the formula, and now we can use deduction to take the given elements, background and examples, and deductively derive every hypothesis that is, that is possible. So B and E entails H gives you a formula for generating hypotheses, okay? And in, in particular, um, you can generate clauses, and uh, I managed to prove that there exists a most specific clause which all of the uh, uh, individual clausal hypotheses entail, right? And because they all entail it, in fact, all of them subsume it. So you can turn this problem with background knowledge into a pure subsumption uh, refinement graph, where you know that once you've considered the entailing hypotheses of the bottom clause, then you've considered the entire hypothesis space. So it's a, it's a way of using the logic, if you like, in order to restrict and simplify the problem. The outcome is you get a bounded search with bottom at the, at, at the base of this and, uh, the, uh, and, the, and the, uh, the, em the uh, empty clause at the top. And the subsuming relationship here holds, right? So whatever our hypothesis is, it subsumes H and H subsumes bottom. So it makes it a much more contained search. And uh, the effect of that when it was used on the first uh, kind of hard problem in trying to identify uh, patterns within molecules uh, that were mutagenic, cancer-causing patterns, is that you got a dramatic reduction in the size of the search. So without the bottom clause, you got three times 10 to the seven clauses that you have to consider. Once you use the bottom clause, it reduces that by a factor of 10,000, and in the end, uh, you can look at 2,500 clauses is enough to, uh, to consider everything that's worth considering, right? The, all of the other clauses actually don't even entail the examples, right? So they are, they're unrelated to the problem. So it's a way of zeroing in on which are the parts of the hypothesis space that are really worth considering. Okay, so uh, that's the, I'm finishing off this first uh, part, and uh, th this is a summary of what I hope you've uh, got an idea of. Logic in entailment gives you a general framework for the notion of generalization. Um, refinement provides a mechanism for search through the space of those generalizations. That's, uh, uh, so the first thing is Plotkin's idea, the second thing is Shapiro's idea, Inverse entailment is a model theoretic approach to ILP based on algebraic transformations of the logical constraints, so it cuts down the space. And then uh, there's a system which incorporated this, the Progol system, which uses admissible search and is efficient because it's, it supports finite uh, interval search. So Progol is still used as a system, uh, though it dates back to the 1990s. It's still widely used and probably the most cited of the ILP systems. And immediately it showed, this new approach showed that you could search spaces that previously were, in, the search techniques were ineffective uh, in handling. Okay, so uh, we're more or less on schedule. Um, if anybody has a short question, I'll answer it at this point. No?
Okay, well, then I'll move on to the next part of the tutorial. So 1.2. Okay, so um, so this is there's a there's a nice story there of a development over maybe twenty years of techniques um, in inductive logic programming, um, but uh, there was a kind of shockwave hit the field in in two thousand and eleven when uh, people had found certain types of, of of problems that really were not being handled properly within the Plotkin framework, or the initial Plotkin framework. And uh, an example of this appeared when uh, people started looking at uh, simple grammar learning uh, to learn uh, automata or uh, finite, uh, or, or uh, context-free grammars. And the paper here, which is an attempt to uh, approach that, comes from 2014, so not, not that long ago. Um, and uh, so, okay, if we, look, if we look at what inspired um, inductive logic programming, really the logic programming movement that Kowalski and others introduced back in the 1980s, we saw as uh, an exciting thing because it showed that you could treat programs as logical f forms of inference and you could formulate programs in, in a clean and clear way. Um, when, when thinking about uh, how to do, how to machine learn such programs, the, the topic of, of uh, inductive logic programming started off with a workshop in 1991 that I, I ran. And the thing that I think inspired most of the people who were there was this idea that if we start with a general purpose programming framework, um, we could do machine learning, not just on decision trees or uh, conjunctions of formulae, we could machine learn arbitrary programs. We could think of this as being a tool in the toolbox of computer science that allows you to go into programming and build any program that you like out of examples. And in fact, a lot of the early stuff that you see in terms of examples, you see people, including my own uh, papers, we're looking at how do you learn quicksort, for instance. Okay, so we're actually inspired by the, the issues in programming. Um, but when we had progressed for some time, um, we found that various different simplifications had been made and there were, uh, uh, you know, there were ways of making systems run more efficiently. And when assessed in 2011, uh, there was a, uh, a meeting or it was a, a panel where people discussed what the limitations were. And there were various basic things that we really couldn't find being done in any of the ILP systems, despite the original intentions. And in particular, this idea of predicate invention and the idea of recursion came out as two things which really were not being handled properly. And in particular, so what is predicate invention? Well, predicate invention, from a programming perspective, this is really central. This is the notion that when I'm writing a function f, right, I would like to be able not just to write it as one huge function description. I would like to break it into parts. And once I've broken it into f1 and f2 uh, and some function between them, then I'll break F1 and F2, each one of those individually and in, into F1.1 and F1.2 and so on. So I'll break, I'll, I'll uh, recursively divide and, and simplify the problem by introducing and subdividing the problem. Okay, it's, it's completely central to, to the idea of programming that we shouldn't, we should do uh, 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 programming in this, in this way that breaks out uh, individual subprograms. And predicate invention, which is introduced in the late 1980s, where there were methods that were there, those methods really hadn't been efficient enough to be used for hard problems. Similarly, recursion was giving all sorts of problems, and people didn't quite see what was going wrong. If you trace it back, you find actually it's to do with limitations of uh, Plotkin's definition of generalized uh, 
uh, of uh, logical generalization with respect to background knowledge. Uh, but to see that, you'd have to read through quite a lot of detail of, of that uh, thesis to understand. But both of these were impeding the systems um, that existed. So um, to look at that problem, uh, um, students and colleagues of mine worked together on a specific problem. And what we were looking at, the starting point can be summarized in this example here. So imagine you're trying to learn a finite state acceptor. Okay, so something simple like this. Um, so this is a parity acceptor. Uh, so uh, it's got two states, Q0, Q1. You come in on the start state, Q0. Uh, you can accept as many zeros as you like. Uh, if you get a one, then you change to state Q1, and you can't accept in state Q1 unless you get another one and go back to Q0. But in Q1, you can accept as many, many zeros as you like. So every string that is accepted must, if you look at it, have an even number of ones. Okay? So unless the string has got an even number of ones, then it's not acceptable. So let's look here uh, at some examples. So the empty string has an even number of ones. So does the string 0, so does the string 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay. If we write this down, we can write this down in prolog. Uh, we can translate it uh, into a, a set of productions, and then we can translate those into something called a definite clause grammar. And a definite clause grammar is a, a recursive program like this, which has uh, the predicate symbols you can imagine just being named after the names of the states. So you've got uh, a definition for Q0. Q0 accepts the empty string, or something with a 0 goes back to Q0. Q0 with a 1 goes to Q1. So you notice with these clauses, there's a direct relationship between each clause and an individual uh, 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 arc in the finite state acceptor. So if I look at this one here that goes Q11 to Q0, that's here, that's Q11 to Q0, okay? And I can associate the kind of strings that are accepted by elements of that uh, clause. So here is one, 101 requires you to, for instance, uh, have that particular clause. Now, if I look at this from the perspective of 2011, there's various different aspects of this tiny, simple little logic program that make it totally intractable. And one of those is that uh, it's not only recursive necessarily, but it's mutually recursive. And in fact, there's a small literature you can see back from the 90s in saying we can't learn mutually recursive definitions. Um, so why? Well, because to do the mutual recursion, you actually have to invent a predicate. And in this case, Q1, if you were just given examples of Q0, you'd have to invent Q1 as a state, and then you'd have to consider how mutual recursion happens within it. So it's got its own definition, and you can't remove any parts of it without destroying the whole structure. So it's a hard problem to learn from a pre uh, 2011 uh, perspective. But take another look at this. Sorry. No, it was possible, but with quite strong restrictions. Okay, so um, the uh, learning of recursion was typically done. You, ha you had to have a base case example such that when you learned the recursion, you could test it down to the point at which the base case accepted, right? If you just had one example, you couldn't learn from that because you'd have to have at least two examples, one containing the recursion and another containing the base case, okay? Whereas here, it seems quite natural that if I was given this example, I could just with that example consider introduction of a new symbol and its recursion back, that should be within the hypothesis space of this generalization. I mean, if I think about it as an entailment relationship, that should be there somewhere in the hypothesis space. But it was not. Um, and it was because of um, 
uh, a, a detail of something called C derivations in Plotkin's thesis that, that people just hadn't done that, okay? But what we did in this paper is we said, let's take a, a different look. Let's look again at this, at what we've got here, and consider the fact that all of these clauses look really very similar. Uh, well, most of them do. These last four all have pretty much the same structure, right? All that's really varying between those clauses is whether you've got a Q0 or a Q1 in the head, Q0 or a Q1 over here, and whether you've got a one or a zero in that column there, and the rest of the structure is identical, right? Um, why is that? Because we've represented this in Chomsky normal form, and in Chomsky normal form, we can always uh, represent every rule in a very simplified way. It's either of this, very, this first type or that second type. Right, so why can't we just tell the learner this to begin with? We say, look, Somehow you're going to learn rules like that, or we're going to learn rules like that, where Q, Q, C, and P, those are the things that we'll select, um, and the rest of it will just always have that structure. Okay? If all we were trying to do was learn uh, regular grammars, this would be a useful thing to tell the learner. Okay. Now, how do we tell it that? Okay, so we want to tell it that these two things are the case. Now, the first problem with, with inductive logic programming is it's all formulated in first order logic, so we can't tell it that information at all. So we have to at least uh, allow ourselves a second order logic so that we can consider variables uh, of that kind uh, within, the, uh, within the, the language of bi that biases the, the learning. But then what, even if we had that, how would we do it? Well, in the case of, a, of learning regular languages, we might consider writing a parser such that the parser somehow incorporated these uh, higher order rules. Okay? And this is such a parser. So for instance here, this parser says, well, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, parse things of this form, Q empty empty or Q CXY, and then we've got some conditions on. And those conditions are, this is only in the case that Q is an acceptor. And this is only in the case that a delta relationship holds between these predicate symbols, uh, Q, P, and, there's, and, and uh, C. Now that delta function is normally what's used in order to identify a particular finite state acceptor, right? You, you can tabulate it usually. So suppose we can think of this as a tabulation. And the rest of this is always the same. Okay, so now what happens? Well, if we, if we were given a particular uh, set of ground facts here, like uh, Q0 is an acceptor and delta one goes Q0, zero, zero, Q0, zero, and so on, where all of these relate to the transitions that we had, the transition arcs, then these two together, these ground facts and that, that, that uh, uh, parser, are sufficient to accept exactly the parity language. So now, okay, we, we, if, you, if you can see that that actually works, if, you've got enough, if you understand the logic of it, then from the machine learning perspective, we don't want to have to be told these facts, we want to be able to guess them, right? So how do we guess those facts if we're not given them together? Well, we're still given this general purpose regular grammar parser. Well, we can do it using logical abduction is the answer. If we just say abduce delta one and acceptor, we can incorporate a very powerful uh, method from logic programming called abduction that works as long as the facts, the only thing that you want to do is, is grab, is, is construct from your examples a set of ground facts that are consistent with the examples. So we've turned the problem of learning general rules, in, in this case, into a problem of learning some specific facts. These specific facts, though, themselves have a kind of higher order aspect to them because they're 
there are facts about predicate symbols. Okay, so this is a delta one has arguments the predicate symbols Q0 and Q1. So these are meta facts of the subgroup. Okay, so the general idea is here you've got uh, a pair, background knowledge and examples. You've got some kind of parser, meta interpreter, uh, which uh, has uh, atomic background. Uh, uh, that can, can be given to it, and the hypothesis is formulated as higher order existentially data log atoms such that BH entail Z. Um, we need to make sure that we can also handle negative examples so that we can do the, a kind of general version of machine learning in this. And in fact, this whole framework is, turns out to be consistent with um, inverse entailment. A special case of inverse entailment involving uh, essentially uh, abduction of facts. <coughs> right, so how does this work in practice? So I'm given um, a set of examples like this. I say parse, this is the, these are the positive examples. You must be able to parse empty, one, one, zero, one, one, et cetera. These are negative examples. Don't parse any of these. And then uh, the negative examples can be written out uh, in, as, uh, as logical formulae. Um, I can, uh, slightly short of time on this, but there's various different uh, properties which are consistent with uh, the properties of, of uh, regular grammars. Uh, so we, the definition of uh, essentially entailment, uh, so general entailment, we can redefine that in terms of the MIL setting. We, we produce a lattice, uh, again, of the same kind that we do in, uh, in inductive logic programming. We have a lattice of, of gen generality relations. It turns out there is a unique top uh, theory, a most general theory which is unique, and there's also a unique bottom theory, a most specific uh, theory in all cases in learning regular grammars. So the question then is, have we just done something very specific here, right? Does this only really work for regular grammars? And in the same paper, we showed, no, actually, it's very straightforward to extend the learning of regular grammars to the learning of context-free grammars uh, in the same way. And all that it requires is going back and looking at the general definitions of what a, a, a context-free grammar is turning those into parse statements with different kinds of delta functions, and you've got a general purpose way of learning context-free grammars. Now this, to me, was shocking because I'd actually looked at trying at the literature of learning uh, context-free grammars and realized nobody had published anything, although there's lo loads and loads of papers on how to learn uh, automata, there aren't any general purpose ways of learning context-free grammars from examples, and there are uh, problems with doing so uh, relating to uh, some of Gold's uh, results. But when you implement this in Prolog, you get the most amazingly compact machine learning algorithms, okay? So here's a, a parser, the one that I showed you before. We introduce an abduction element into it, two-line definition of how to do abduction using member, and we give you a set of scolum functions at the bottom, which uh, are scolum constants, and then uh, a query. A query to that program simply consists of the list of positive examples, and the list of negative examples with not in front of them, and you pass that query to Prolog, and Prolog comes back and says the answer is and it's a set of deltas, okay? So Prolog, just, just taking this little input, this small amount of input, comes back and gives you an answer. And if you look carefully at the answer here, delta S101, one, S11, one, S0, is the parity uh, uh, acceptor. It's found the parity acceptor from that small number of examples. If you give it any smaller, then it'll actually not find it. If you give it, give it any more, it'll find it, right? Uh, so if you give it uh, a superset of these, this is the simplest explanation of that set of examples. What is the next answer of that? I 
Uh, if I had Prolog running here, I would tell you, but it basically it gives you an infinity of different answers. This is the first one in the derivation tree that it finds. And basically, this answer is just negation of failure. Negation is failure, yeah. Yeah. So, you, so couldn't be simpler. Uh, it, it's lo it logically makes sense. You can give all of your positive and negative examples in one line as a query, and it tells you the answer, right? It tells you there's a finite state machine, and this does it, right? All done using the simplest of prologue to do it. Okay, so, so this was very exciting uh, the first time that we did it. We then thought, okay, we need, need to uh, uh, carry out some experiments to see um, how we can, uh, how well this approach works. So we formulated something called Metagol R for regular grammars um, and uh, uh, various different hypotheses for the experiments that you can't learn from randomly chosen regular languages. You can't outperform uh, state-of-the-art ILP systems. You can't learn randomly chosen context-free grammars. So these are all null hypotheses. Uh, so, and, uh, and so on. And then we ran experiments by randomly sampling uh, uh, hy hypotheses and uh, example sets. And we got a set of results uh, which were interesting. So Metagol R, for instance, here, in terms of predictive accuracy, outperforms uh, one of the most recent state-of-the-art uh, ILP systems there by a considerable degree. I mean, so this is topping out way before uh, Metagol R is. The, looking at the time, Metagol R is taking hugely less time to do so. When we look uh, at the second hypotheses, we're finding that with context-free grammars, the situation's even better. We're learning Metagol CF is continuously learning and improving its performance, whereas MC Toplog is, uh, is actually degrading after some time. The time, again, is completely way out here. So these are, you know, imagine uh, 60,000 uh, milliseconds, and this is really low for Metagol CF. And then we improved the performance even better by having a, a system Metagol RCF, which simply starts off by assuming that the grammar is regular, and then if it finds there are no solutions, it switches to, being, to looking for a context-free grammar. And this does even better than either Metagol CR or Metagol CF. So it, it outperforms it, but again, both in terms of speed and time, which is, uh, uh, which is quite satisfactory because you can, you can understand what's going on in terms of the sizes of hypotheses, that are, the size of the hypothesis space that's being, uh, that's being searched. And you can, you can look at that and explain it in terms of the Bloomer bound, which is what, what the, one of the most basic uh, computational learning theory bounds for this. So we were able to use the same approach for learning simple things like a, a, you know, a grammar for a small dog walks into the house. And in this case, you can see that individual noun uh, phrase components, verb phrase, noun phrase, and so on, are being built by the context-free grammar learner. Um, and uh, so th this is related work. There's quite a lot of related work um, by Inouye, uh, Huiguera. This is a big uh, survey that was done in 2010. Um, there's some learnability results and context-free grammar learning. This is the closest to a general purpose uh, context-free grammar learning from 2000. Sakakibara's one in 2002 requires that you have parsed sentences rather than, rather than example sequences given. So, uh, and Langley and Stromston is, is a purely uh, heuristic approach. So uh, there's no guarantees of convergence. So summary and limitations. Metro interpretive learning looked like something interesting, right? This is something we hadn't seen before in our community, yes. Uh, good question. We haven't tried uh, very hard problems um, because we set off in a different direction after this. Um, but 
there are standard linguistic barriers, I suppose, to do with um, uh, how do you, for instance, handle things like anaphora, right? So, so language learning is pretty hard, and there's things that are, people know are not handled by context-free uh, grammars. So that's one, and, and um, agreement of verbs and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, as far as taking fragments of, 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 English, of English and learning those context-free uh, fragments, there's no reason not to do so, um, that you're bound to, to hit certain barriers in terms of the complexity of what can be learned. And in later things that I'll show you, we, we know that there are limits as to the size of the theory that you can consider before the, the search becomes overwhelming. Okay, so, I'll, so there's, this is a kind of ongoing story. But um, so, uh, so what did we cover here? So we've covered meta-interpretive learning, its theory and so on, the grammar, application, the predicate invention and recursion. The fact that this is a, this is a form of declarative bias, this idea that you can give these kind of general purpose rules of the kind that I showed you uh, for, what a, for what a regular grammar consists of. Um, and we were left with a lot of questions at the en end of it. So for instance, uh, by using this kind of top-down uh, uh, theorem proving that you get for free in Prolog, uh, are you not giving yourself a headache? Shouldn't you be trying answer set programming? If you're looking at grammar parsing, shouldn't you also have some notion of chart parsing underneath to make it more efficient? Uh, there are natural, uh, you know, what can we learn in terms of natural grammars, which is your question. Um, what happens when you try to learn from nothing with no, no background knowledge, and so on. Um, but we decided that in terms of uh, our uh, resources and efforts, we wanted to see whether or not learning grammars was really, was really at the core of what was going on with meta-interpretive learning or whether we should be looking at more general logics. Um, and that's what the next, uh, the next lecture is going to be about. So the learning of mon monadic and, and dyadic logics. Hi. To recursive um, so languages. Yeah, so in your example, you're feeding in positive and negative yeah. um, examples for context free languages, but it strikes me that you could similarly do, uh, do the same thing with positive and negative examples of strings that would be acceptable if they can learn from strings. Yes, yes, true. Um, so, and I, th I hope that this is going to address that because what we discovered when we looked outside of the, the grammars is that the, the universal Turing machines are an interesting generalization of what we were doing. Um, and so hopefully I'll show you some of that in this lecture. Okay, so... Um, So meta-interpretive learning of higher-order dyadic data log. Uh, so this is the next step, or this, from our point of view, is the next step at that point. Um, the paper, if you want to take a look at it, uh, came out in the Machine Learning Journal back in 2015, uh, and that's it there. Uh, the kind of central issue is this, this representation of higher-order dyadic data log, which is something that we came up with uh, I mean, obviously, higher-order logic, people have done a lot in that. Uh, but for some reason, people hadn't taken seriously the data log fragment uh, of higher-order logic. And in particular, we thought we wanted to concentrate on the dyadic fragment uh, for reasons that I hope will become clear. Um, and we wanted to really take a look at the issue of predicate invention, which had come up in, in the grammars, but is... Um, is prevalent in all kind of uh, general purpose programming issues. Same, similar kind of motivation as last time. Uh, 
Um, but uh, we're wanting to look at how to solve this general problem of predicate invention and recursion uh, in inductive logic programming, not just in grammar learning. Okay, so uh, we thought, okay, what, what do we start with? Um, now let's take the standard uh, you know, introduction to prologue one, where you're shown how you can, you can uh, define a family relation uh, as a logic program. Okay, so um, imagine you've got this family tree here, uh, Jake and Matilda get married, they have various different offspring who marry and so on, uh, and at the bottom you've got various different individuals. Okay, so you can represent uh, that family tree as a tree, but you can represent similar information, including generalizations of what's there in a target theory. So particular facts might be things like Ted is the father of Bob, uh, and Ted's father of Jane. But you might also want more general facts like um, every parent uh, pair is a mother pair. So mother XY implies parent XY, father XY implies parent XY. Uh, you also might want to define recursive things in this setting. So, for instance, ancestor is naturally defined recursively, saying that every parent pair is an ancestor pair. And uh, similarly, uh, if X is the parent of Z and Z is the parent of Y, then X is the parent of Y. Okay. So, um, so as a we haven't yet defined what the learning problem is yet, but. There's different ways that you might do this. Well, one way is I give you some examples about parent, I give you some examples about ancestor, and then I maybe learn each one of those definitions separately, uh, and then I'm done. Okay, so that's a kind of standard approach in machine learning and also in ILP. But what we were interested in here was what about predicate in invention and recursion, right? So why not strip the whole thing down? Let's say, I don't, I'm not gonna tell you about parent. I'm just gonna give you examples of ancestor here. And I'm gonna give you some, I'm gonna give you the relationships of fathership, mothership, et cetera, from the family tree. And then, you then the learner has to construct the whole rest of the theory. So that means not only building a recursive def definition of ancestor, but also introducing the parent relationship, okay? So inventing that, it, may, it won't give it the name parent, it'll call it just something arbitrary, let's say, that's happy with that. But is it possible just from examples to do all of that? Because that's equivalent to what we were trying to do when we were learning um, the parity example, okay? Because we had to learn recursive uh, transitions, and we had to introduce new states. In this case, parent is like a new state. Right, when we do that, um, we're gonna have to think about the information that's represented. We can think about it in first order terms, so we have examples, background knowledge, and hypotheses, which look like this. But when, uh, a, when a, a, a meta-interpretive learner learns things, it has these it, it basically considers various different higher order facts. And we'll call these meta substitutions, okay? So we'll have facts a bit like this, but there'll be instances of particular um, meta rules, okay? So just as before, we had instances, if you remember, of the transition function. Here, we're going to have to have instances of general forms of rule. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, so here's a generalization to begin with of the, par the notion of a parser, right? If you generalize the notion of a parser to general purpose programming, you get the notion of an interpreter, right? So a program interpreter in Prolog can be defined in a couple of uh, program clauses. One tells you what happens um, in the base case, when you're answering a query and you've got nothing left, then uh, you get the program. Um, I'm giving this, I'm turning the, this though into something which creates a program, okay, and has a given program. So think about the arguments here. The first argument of prove, think of those as the examples that are being given, 
The second argument is the background knowledge, and the third argument is going to be the hypothesis. Now, this hypothesis, unlike the one that I've shown you so far, the third argument contains the second argument. So it's an extension of the, of the, uh, of the second argument. But these are programs, okay? Now, when we try to prove examples, the atoms here, we do so not like Prolog. Prolog goes off and tries to grab a clause from its clause base to prove it. What this meta interpreter does, it goes off and it gets a meta rule, which has a general higher order form, but it still has an atom in the head and a body to it. And uh, by when, it, when it matches the atom that comes in, the example that comes in, it unifies that with the head of the meta rule, creating a partial meta substitution. Okay? So it creates some substitution for predicate symbols and constants within that meta substitution. It has associated, this turned out to be a very important aspect that uh, hadn't been necessary in the grammar learning. You need to have some kind of ordering over the search. Um, and so that's represented by an order constraint, which has to hold. And having found the meta substitution, you then have to ab abduce it or simply save that substitution into a substitution base. And the substitution base, it turns out, is the revised program. Okay, so you're taking a set of substitutions that come in and you're adding further substitutions into it so that your final program is simply a set of substitutions, right? So you think, well, I wanted a program. Why did, I've only, only got a set of substitutions, but they're substitutions associated with meta rules. So as soon as you substitute them into the meta rules, you've got a first order program, okay? So it may sound complicated, but it's, it's, it seems it was exactly the thing that was required. But there's a second part. There's a double recursion here. Having uh, matched the head, you now have to go in and prove the body, right? So the body is from the meta rule. The body, if you, if you remember, is basically undefined, right? So you now have to prove that, and in the process of proving it, you extend the program even further. But what have you extended it by doing? Either you've matched some things that you already had introduced as predicates, or you've introduced new predicates in the process of proving it, right? So all this happens as a, as a side effect of this recursion. And then you have to prove the rest of the examples, right? So by doing that double recursion, you take one pass through all of the examples, and in the process, you construct the whole program consistent with those examples. Maybe, obviously, with some backtracking involved, but the overall structure is extremely simple and related to top-down programming. You're, this thing is writing a top-down program. This is going down into the structure and constructing further invented predicates and predicates required by those invented predicates, and then finishing off by ensuring that they all agree with the examples. OK, so uh, now, the, now the mystery. What are the meta rules? OK, well, to understand the meta rules, we have to in the case that I was showing you, you have to look, as we did with the grammar, at the form of the rules here. And you notice once more that all of these clauses here are suspiciously similar to each other. They're all the same clause. They just have various different predicate symbols involved. So we're going to have to have, oh, sorry, these, these three are the same. That one's different, OK? And th those are different. So we're going to have to have meta rules associated with each different form of clause that we've got there. This first one gives us ground facts, okay? So when that's executed, then the x's and y's become constants, and those constants are abduced as you normally would in an abduction engine. The second one, pxy of qxy, generates a, a clause that's like this, but with substitutions for p and q, and the order constraint says that there's a total ordering over the predicate symbols such that P must be greater than Q. That's critical because that's to do with forcing um, a, a, a termination, I'll, I'll show you later, of both the learning process and the program that's learned. So you, can, you end up with a guarantee that this, this program is going to terminate. Chain, the chain rule, gives you PXY of QXY. Ry 
So that's a bit like um, the ancestor rule, except the ancestor rules can also be thought of a special case of this thing called tail rec, which again has orderings. So these orderings here are p greater than q and q greater, p greater than r, whereas in tail rec, it turns out you need an additional constraint to ensure something called interval convergence, which uh, turned out to be important. So that's this constraint here over the constants involved. Okay, so there's something weird going on in these because uh, you might uh, ask the question, so why are these lowercase x and y and why are those uppercase x and y? Well, there's a, there's a notation that's being used here. Uppercase means existentially quantified variable. Lowercase means universally quantified variable. When the prove, when the, uh, when the, the meta interpreter runs, it saves the substitutions only of the existentially quantified variables in these rules and leaves the universally quantified variables as they are. So that's how this works. And if you think about it logically, would you ever really want a rule that said, for instance, P of XY is true for all Q XY, and that's universally quantified. It doesn't make sense. It's not true for all P and Q, clearly. But in your program, there may exist, exist a P and a Q such that those things are true, and that's the semantics of these meta rules. They're to do with finding solutions for uh, so the substitutions that give a program fragment. Okay, so the, the general form is this. You have a general meta rule, can be formulated by putting existentially quantified variables for P and Q, universal for X and Y. And the whole idea here is that that can then support predicate and object invention through the order constraints. Whoops, only 15 minutes to get the coffee. Um, and uh, yeah, so in the family relations, we consider data log logic programs. Um, and we consider a fragment which we call H22. So H22 might sound as though it's hydrogen or oxygen or something, but it's actually a hypothesis space of logic programs in which you have at most two uh, variables or two uh, place, uh, uh, places for each predicate. Okay, so you're allowed up to dyadic predicates. And in the body of the definition, you're allowed up to two atoms in the body. Okay, so it's, again, it's uh, reminiscent of the constraints for Chomsky normal form, uh, but in, placed in a kind of logic programming setting. So arity at most two and two atoms in the body. So uh, what, what, what is H22? It seems, uh, it seems to work for our little uh, uh, family relations fragment. Um, but does it, you know, what, what are its boundaries? Now, it turns out that that question has been asked quite a long time ago. In 1977, Tarnland, I think in the second logic programming, uh, international logic programming uh, conference, uh, answered that question and showed that, in fact, H22 is, is sufficiently general to contain a universal Turing machine. It's very expressive, right? Surprisingly expressive, right? Because you think, well, you can't really do very much with a language like that. But here's a, a variant of that universal, uh, of the universal Turing machine. So we just call it UTM. Imagine that the variables represent um, tapes or lists. Um, in the first statement, it says uh, if, the, uh, if the tape S has a halt statement on it, then terminate. Um, in the second one, it says uh, look at the, at the, uh, the, t the tape S, execute it to give you the new tape S1, and then, and then iterate. Okay, so this gives you kind of the, the central loop of a, of a universal Turing machine, uh, the execute loop. And then lastly, what does execute mean? It means fetch an instruction, and the instruction fetch is done by simply inspecting the, the tape, identifying where the present uh, 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 execution symbol is, let's call it F, and then applying F to the tape, right? So here you have a, an explicit uh, second order formula, uh, which uh, is an, uh, an important variant of this. So if you 
Um, if you have H22, you, in, in your learning setting, you have a problem, right? And the problem uh, is the halting problem, right? How can we ensure that if we're taking that fragment H22, that we will halt, not only halt in terms of the learning, process, the learning procedure, but any of the programs themselves? Because if we can't guarantee that the programs halt, we can't guarantee that the learning will halt, if you think about it, because the learning has to actually execute the program. And if, it doesn't, if the program doesn't halt, then the learning will not halt. And to find a solution to that, we uh, went right back uh, to uh, Newton Bendix. I don't, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Newton Bendix. Fantastic piece of work in the 1970s on rewrite rules, trying to find how you, how you formulate uh, uh, a set of rewrite rules that are confluent. Okay? These are... These are, these are general rewrites that uh, you want to ensure come to a halt. They actually stop. Um, so that Newton bendix approach was proved to work, but it applies only to rewrite rules. It was extended then by Yaya uh, Fernandez and Minker in 94 to apply to data log programs, so guaranteed termination data log programs that include recursion. And um, this is done in both cases by assuming certain kinds of orderings. So orderings over the rules or orderings over the predicate symbols. If you, lots of different orderings are involved. Okay, so one of them, if you ensure that the Herbrand base is totally ordered, you can guarantee termination simply by the fact that every proof is, if every proof is forced to consider only things lower in the ordering in order to complete the proof, you can guarantee that as long as you're always heading down the ordering and that there's a finite, finite termination at the end, I mean, it's, it's, it's finite downwards, maybe infinite upwards, but finite downwards, then you can't go uh, lower than the base of the uh, Herbrand base. So uh, in, in what we did, and you saw it in that, in that order constraint, we use both lexicographic uh, uh, orders and uh, interval orders. Interval orders, uh, uh, you imagine the way this in terms of a sequence where you've got x and z and x and y, uh, and we said that x and y you must have, uh, uh, must contain z. What that ensures is as you recurse down to x to versus z, you're shrinking and shrinking an interval over the natural number sequence. And again, you can easily demonstrate that you can't keep shrinking forever until the two, uh, two values coincide within the natural numbers. So that was one of the, the, the things that made Metabol, uh, that Im improved it because it guaranteed termination. The second thing was looking at um, uh, the question of how you can learn a set of concepts. Okay, suppose that I'm giving you five different things that you have to learn. If you provide an epi episode sequence, so it says before you learn, uh, let's say, ancestor, you, should, you need to learn parent. And before you learn parent, you have to learn something before it. So you can show very easily that if you try to learn everything simultaneously, then you get an exponential explosion in the search. If you instead, because basically you've got a product search, you've got all these hypothesis spaces and the product of the hypothesis space is the one that you're searching. If you search them in order, it's the sum of the hypothesis spaces, right, which is much more tractable, okay? So by introducing <coughs> sequencing episodes over the learning, you can guarantee uh, uh, better, much better efficiency. Within uh, an episode, then there's a, another thing to increase the efficiency, which is to do um, what in other areas of artificial intelligence is called um, uh, uh, iterative deepening. That is, you start off by considering that the size of the definition that you're trying to learn has, has size zero, 
i.e., in order to explain the examples, you don't need anything additional, right? The background knowledge you've got already explains it. Suppose that fails, right? So there's a certain example that can't be, can't be explained, right? Now, for those examples, you then consider a definition of, with one clause in it, right? Now, with one clause, you can only, define, you can only consider uh, quite simple programs, and you can exhaust that clause quite, that set quite quickly. If you fail to find a one-clause solution, you then step onto two clauses, and so on, right? So what's the advantage of this? The advantage is you're always considering the smallest hypothesis space that you possibly can, which is a cheap thing. You know, it's, it's cheaper to search. Um, but secondly, if you think about it, at the end of that process, you guarantee that the hypothesis that fits is the smallest hypothesis that can fit because you've considered all smaller hypothesis spaces. Right, with all the above, you can get a pack result out of uh, this meta-interpretive learning that's probably approximately correct result, which is in the paper, by showing that if you put a constraint of log 2n where uh, you say uh, I've got n examples, I'm only ever going to consider small definitions of up to the logarithm of the number of examples I've got, in that particular case, the, the space is sufficiently bounded to ensure that you can, uh, you, can, you can find the solution in polynomial time and the error is polynomially bounded um, in the size of the formula. Okay, so all of this gave us an implementation. The, Git, the implementation is available to anybody who wants to download it from its uh, GitHub site. And we've developed a, a nice uh, user interface, uh, which you can use to put your examples in, so you don't have to type in into uh, type in lots of prolog and get lots of uh, errors in the process that from your typing. So this PHP interface you can also try out uh, and try some of the simple examples. What you'll find is it's actually it might sound as though uh, the search is going to take a long time, but in fact, it's blindingly fast. Most of the things that you try will take a fraction of a second in order to find solutions. Um, so uh, so I, I suggest giving it a go. Uh, in, our, in our experiments, we tried out um, uh, doing more complicated programs uh, in, our, in our first paper, which was actually at Ichikai. Uh, we looked at robot examples, robot strategy examples, and we built little programs that contained a mixture of actions in, form, in the form of dyadic predicates and uh, tests, um, uh, fluents, uh, which were monadic predicates. So this is our, our language, our H2 language in operation. There was various different predicate inventions here. The thing we were trying to learn in this case, suppose that you're given, a robot is given a, a bunch of examples and plays around and sees some of the structures that it makes when it puts them together, they fall over and some of them don't, right? So you want the positive examples for stability of a built thing uh, come from those that don't fall over, right? Okay, so you've got A, B, and C. So in fact, C will, uh, will fall over because it'll collapse in the middle. B will fall over if you make it high enough. Uh, a, if you keep on extending it, is the kind of thing that you see in every wall in the world. So we'd like to be able to learn something like A. And this little strategy, after, uh, after giving it enough positive and negative examples, learns something that will accept structures like A um, and reject structures like B and C. And it did so by inventing both actions and uh, fluence uh, in the process. Uh, again, we trained this by providing random inputs um, uh, in terms of numbers of examples. You can see that Metagol D actually goes up from a, a base level of about 50% up to close to, or, uh, uh, well, a bit below 100% in, in a, a relatively small number of examples, right? So after about 20 examples. It's a fairly complex domain. But what's also encouraging is that the time that it takes increases pretty much as a 
uh, something quite close to linear. Um, so the, the, the various different approaches that we put in to make it more efficient were, uh, were effective in practice. We tried it in other domains. So this was uh, something, uh, a project going on at um, uh, Carnegie Mellon called the Never Ending Learning of Language. So the project is based on applying natural language parsers to web pages. Uh, its slogan is read the web. So you just read everything that's out there on the web. Uh, after a few, couple of years, they had 50 million facts of, in the form of triples, and these triples were ideal for a dyadic learner, right? So we just thought, ah, oh, we want to have these. So these were a, a small set that uh, Tom Mitchell sent me when we started looking at this. Uh, so it has things like play sports, so it's got a name, Eva Longoria plays baseball, and so on. So there's various different facts about American sports. And we were able to use those in order to learn rules such as the, as the one up here. Um, in the process, we unveiled uh, a bug in the NEL system um, because although we learned rules that they agreed were consistent, uh, when you applied them to the actual stadiums and so on in America and looked up the web pages, you found actually they're wrong. They're making wrong predictions. And the reason is because they had some assumptions built into NEL about the relationship between how many football teams had, were in state. They were assuming every, every there was a one-to-one -one relationship between stadiums and football uh, uh, um, teams. And it turned out that that was not the case. And that comes out, I think, in, in some of these examples. So one and three uh, disagree uh, with reality when you look them up. We were able to also to learn some simple higher order meta rules of this kind. Uh, to explain uh, symmetry. Um, and so we, this was something that Nell, uh, they didn't have any way of doing this. They were putting in all of these kind of symmetry relationships by hand. Um, and yeah, so this is related work. It's quite a lot of related work. Uh, so uh, in particular, um, this work uh, uh, in at the National Institute of Informatics in Tokyo, uh, they had been doing a kind of abductive uh, predicate invention. Uh, this is Katsumi Inoue's work, using, uh, using rules in a way that is, is somewhat uh, related to what we're doing. So they do what they call meta-level abduction. Uh, when looking more carefully at it, they, the authors agreed with me that what they were doing was essentially propositional, right? So the thing, that uh, was different in our meta-interpretive learning was that we were dealing with relations, the dyadic relations. Um, so uh, we, there's also quite a long literature going back on uh, the use of higher order uh, background knowledge within ILP. Uh, so particularly Lloyd has wrote a book back in 2003, but there's quite big differences between the higher order representation that he uses and ours. Uh, and there's this work on higher order pro-goal learning, which was also uh, relevant. OK, so just to summarize, these are the various different things we achieved. Just again, um, in terms of uh, formulating a kind of declarative machine learning. There's this is something, a term that Luke Durant used back in 2012. His intention there was that all of machine learning could be replaced by constraint solvers, right? Uh, and because the formulation of hypotheses is a constraint solving problem, uh, which I, I like that idea. Um, the, the issue is how do you formulate the declarative statements and what kind of statements are you allowed? Our meta rules are declarative statements, and our way of solving them is a, a form of, of uh, constraint solving. Um, it can be done using this approach, and in a ways group has shown that meta interpretive learning can be done using answer set programming. Uh, but the idea of incorporating a kind of general purpose meta interpreter as the learner. Um, uh, reflects uh, Luke's idea in, in that paper, I think. So, uh, it's all, so we found that H22 is, is a tractable language. It's also Turing complete. Uh, 
uh, and we can think of it as a fragment of the higher order logic. The new Bendix style ordering allows us to guarantee terminations. There's something really satisfying to me in using, using this approach because you, it shows that you can get guarantees on the termination and the properties of programs as you're formulating them. You can build that, those guarantees in so that you've already proved the termination criterion by the time you've formulated the, the hypothesis in this setting. Going beyond classification learning, so pretty much all of machine learning actually is just about classification um, or uh, maybe regression in some cases. But we've been able to show uh, several times uh, that you can do things like strategy learning where you're learning quite complex uh, structural hypotheses in this kind of setting. So um, uh, these are some of the limitations. This first one we haven't really solved. Dealing with classification noise, I'll tell you about in one of the upcoming lectures. Probabilistic meta-interpretive learning, how do you introduce probabilities into the hypothesis and into the search process? And active learning, how do you avoid um, the kind of curiosity gap that's typical of machine learning, that you just have to load all this data in, and the, the, the learner does very little in, in, in the selection process. If we think about so, uh, something like scientific experimentation, it's an active process where you carry out experiments in the world in order to gather your data. And active learning um, is something that we've started to explore uh, in our group within the context of this kind of probabilistic meta-interpretive learning. 